A normal thanks to our $5 fans. Matthias Eichler, John Mitchell, Theodore Severson, Brennan Flory, Joel Hausman, Joel Gerhold, Dennis Bailey, Dave Bailey, and Kevin Cosgrove. A special thanks to our $20 fan, Gosha, courtesy of her loving husband, Thomas. And a very special thanks to our corporate host, Adobe Typekit. <laughs> All right. We are live. Are we live now? Hello? I'm on. Hey. All right. Uh, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming so much. Welcome uh, to this. Uh, a totally live recording, uh, live in front of a studio audience. You guys all look very live. Uh, uh, of Let's Make Mistakes. Um, we have a show uh, that we normally record uh, in a much smaller room. So I'm very excited. Wearing much less clothes, by the way. Yeah, the fact that you're not wearing sweatpants is really great. If you're lucky, I if wear I'm, sweatpants. Yeah, yeah. So we got Mike to wear real clothes, and we are here to record Let's Make Mistakes, uh, which is a show, uh, a podcast, an internet uh, broadcast in we which should, we talk we about tell design. Them our names. That's oh, we. The slide. Why don't yeah. you start? I'm Mike Montero. I'm Katie Gillum. That's the slide. That's the slide. Uh, that's a great way to uh, transition to the fact that we are not only uh, recording for the for the joy and uh, probably bewilderment of the people in this room um, in the Chaplin Theater at Adobe in San Francisco, we are also recording for our home home office and office listeners. Uh, so we may need to explain a few things, uh, people in the audience. But people at home can know that this time when Mike is ranting, he is staring deep into the eyes of someone, some poor soul in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, why don't we? Do you, what, do we, what do we talk about in the show usually? We talk about design sometimes. It's barely. Yep. I mean, it's supposed to be about design. Talk a little bit about design. Uh, we talk about research. We talk about basketball sometimes. Yeah, we talk about how fat Sean Kemp is. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm so tired of the Sean Kemp stuff. Uh, our listeners at home will be very aware. Uh, maybe people here aren't as much. Actually, that's a great question. H who here has listened to Let's Make Mistakes before? All right. Like a nice, good, mediocre number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we are part of the Mule Radio Syndicate, which you can get to at muleradio.net. And we currently have four shows, this being the best one of them. Um, yeah, watch out, man. <laughs> we'll talk about those later. Yeah. yeah. We'll plug those later. But you're not sitting here, are you? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, first, we, first, wait, I want to get this out of the way. Okay. First off, <laughs> Creative Mornings is the brainchild of, um, Tina Roth Eisenberg, which you may know as Swiss Miss. Mm -hmm. She makes the whole thing happen. She does indeed. And, um, she doesn't like it when we curse, as yeah. you can see from this tweet. So, stand up, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> With the jar, Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin has a swear jar. Yep. So while you're asking us questions or while we're talking, if you swear, that's a dollar. Hey, I'm starting a tab. <laughs> I don't need a tab. I got self restraint. Uh, that better be there at the end of the show, by the way. <laughs> uh, for the listeners at home, we have a, a, a swear jar. Is anything else you want to narrate? Since no. you're now a new radio, you're a, you're a radio star. You like to do the sound effects. Um, we're good. Well, so this, this week uh, we are um, going to cover a lot of different topics. Uh, a lot of them will be at the discretion of the lovely studio audience here who are going to be, a feel free to ask us uh, questions about whatever um, after, after uh, a little brief introduction. Um, but so let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsors. Let's Make Mistakes is brought to you by Typekit, bringing real fonts to the web. Typekit. Typekit. <laughs> Real font, web, type kit. All right, welcome to Let's Make Mistakes. Uh, <laughs> what, um, you're, looking, you're looking pretty dapper. You are really not wearing sweatpants. 
Um, did you? I'm wearing sweatpants under these. Okay, that explains <laughs> long johns. Well, the short ones. <laughs> oh, my, good. My cutoffs. Very familiar with those, unfortunately. Sweat shorts. Uh, <laughs> what? What should we talk about? I washed them. <laughs> How? <laughs> when you wear them inside out, that's washing. I isn't let it? the neighbor's cat sleep on them last night. That counts as washed. Yep. yep. It's the oil wash. What uh, do you want to talk about? We could talk about anything, really. Um, did Let's we talk about this? <laughs> oh, good. Why don't you explain what you just uh, sprung upon me there? You knew this was coming. Oh, did I? Yeah. Just from the moment I saw that yesterday on the internet, I knew this was coming. Well, this came out yesterday. Yeah. This is, um, did you know Time was still publishing? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I did yesterday morning. I mean, but it published to the internet, right? That's what you're talking about. They do online publishing. No, they actually Oh, this is real? Yeah, they make real magazines. Really? So this came out yesterday, yeah. and uh, why do you, you you spent a lot of yesterday talking about this and also Mitt Romney? But this uh, really dominated your day. I remember because I needed to talk to you about other things. So why don't you tell me like what exactly, um, especially for the listeners at home, this is the the picture of uh, Jamie Lynn Grummet, uh, the 26 year old mother of a three year old breastfeeding. That, that kid's not three. <laughs> He's 18. <laughs> He's 18. Uh, he, why don't you explain the look older, of wonder on your he face He looks right older now. than three. He does. Well, it's the shoes that make him look older than three, which you can't totally see in this picture. Um, but the shoes really... He's got huge feet. <laughs> he does have huge feet. Yeah, right? Yeah, well, he's got a lot of protein. <laughs> yeah. So why do you... What, what do you think you like about this picture so much? That, why is it, what, is, what is so exciting to you about it? I don't know if I like this picture. I like the controversy that this all started. Um, it's kind of amazing that this is what magazines are down to in order to sell stuff. So what do you mean like sexualizing motherhood and what 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 do you what do you uh think this is down to? There's a gr- grown child yep sucking on a naked breast on the cover of Time. Mhm. Go on. I'm this is from a man who regularly wears sweat hot pants, so I want you to go on a little further. Well, I'm j- I usually have to walk a little farther into the magazine store to buy porn. <laughs> so you think this is actually pornographic? Well, I don't know. I don't know about pornographic. It's it seems desperate to me. Well, so I think it's the problem. I is that like getting uh, breastfeeding normalized. It would be great. I would love it if they were doing that. How is breastfeeding not normalized? It's totally not. People don't like. People don't do it in public. People, like women get kicked out of, of Wait, whoa, whoa, stores. whoa, whoa. Let's well, let's be careful here about defining normalized as doing it in public. <laughs> Okay, let's let's talk about what people can't people get kicked out of stores for it. People get kicked out of shops. People get kicked out of public places that are you know technically, uh, you know maybe some corporation owns them or something. It's not the breastfeeding part. It's the breastfeeding a three year old. I know. Part. So what I'm saying is I feel like I'm and he's annoyed. Not three, at, he's like seven. Yeah, the eight year old on the cover. <laughs> is that this like? There's enough trouble like normalizing breastfeed, breastfeeding, which as you said should I don't be normal. Think it needs like to this be is normalized. I think it's normalized. But it's not. I think it is. Just because you've seen it before doesn't mean it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot there's just a so lot of help like, me out. Okay. All right. Go on. Why don't you define for me what you think normalized breastfeeding is? I think uh being able to uh you know, like probably cover yourself up but uh do it in public. Um, and be able to... I see that all the time. Well, we're in San Francisco. Like, this is normal in San Francisco. (laughs) The problem I see is that, like, the the way that this is setting it up is whether or not this is normal, as opposed to just, like, presenting breastfeeding. So I did... uh, Knowing that you had spent a lot of time on this yesterday, I did a little research on it. Okay. And so the person who... uh, uh, in expecting that you might bring it up today. Uh, the person who took this picture is Martin Schlesser. He's a German photographer who does all those, he does these really tight shots of celebrities. They're like usually like a, just their f- people's face up and it's really brightly lit on a white background. Um, and he said that he took this picture and had him standing on the chair just to emphasize um, how weird it was. I, I don't think it's the chair that makes it weird, Katie. <laughs> Oh, the fact that she's 26 and has like an eight-year-old also is a little bit weird. That's a little weird. Well, I just that, think I think there's a, really a li- aggressive raises, title, by the way. 
I know the whole thing. Are you I mom think, enough? Right. But are you mom enough to what? Spend your life with your child attached to your nipple? Or are you mom enough to not do that? And I just feel like what it does is it's setting up a, you know, a judgment of like it's whether or not you're judgmental. doing this. Yeah, it's so judgmental. I hate it. Uh, so, so you that, hate this cover? Um, I hate the... I hate the, the the idea of of that question applied to the cover. I think the it's this is talking about attachment parenting and the name of the article, um, especially when you watch read it online, is uh, the man who changed breastfeeding, and it just it's a very which is odd, right? Uh, especially because the front it's all about like sort of high five to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> who is the man who changed breastfeeding? He's an old, he's a wrinkly man. And how did he all change? I paid attention to was her and the photographer. How did he change breastfeeding? I mean, it seems like a pretty simple operation to me. Yeah, he did this. He he made attachment parenting a thing. I mean, it was a thing already. Like it happened in you know Aboriginal cultures for years, but he made it a thing in the West, and so then he gets to change breastfeeding. Fine. The whole thing I think is um, offensive because it it sets up like a standard for mothering. It sets up a standard for breastfeeding. It has the idea that this man, by telling women that they should keep their children strapped to them, has changed breastfeeding, has changed motherhood. He hasn't. This is trying to sell the magazine. And here we are talking about it. So hats off, Time Warner. Yeah, I mean, it totally worked as far as getting attention. All right. Um, is this, that's it? We're She's done? She's a mommy blogger, by Can the way. Can we go? Do we talk about that? Oh, no. Wait, go on. We're going to talk about mommy blogging? <laughs> you seem to. I don't know if we... About would. the incredible exploit exploitation of your own family in order to sell banner ads <laughs> do you want to go there i think you just did oh okay yeah um well why don't we uh why don't we do some question and answers are, th are, are there other things about this that y you want to talk about the mommy blog bloggers we can do it oh, that's fine maybe some questions will come up yeah so just ruminate on that everyone uh mike is ready ready to talk about mommy bloggers i love mommy bloggers by the way, that statement was brought to you by Febreze. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I, I think the last thing about that picture, um, which we don't have to go back to, is uh, she's so young. It's such a weird thing. I just feel like it sets up standards that I'm, I'm not interested in having associated with motherhood. And it was created as the norm of motherhood. I mean, there are young mothers. That's totally fine. It's just this sort of sexualizes it and turns it into a thing. So what do you think the... Um what, what do you th think the, um, God damn it. <laughs> I already, I have a tab. You're just going to point to him? Mike just pointed to the swear jar. The approval process for, not, uh, the audition, thank you. What do you think the auditions for that cover were like? Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, seriously. Yeah, there's some like, interesting. Uh, it wasn't like they, they had the perfect person in mind from the get-go. No, they had to find. They, they, I mean, they. Well, I mean, she's a mommy blogger, so she's probably out so, there and puts herself out about this. So, so picture a room full of. I don't want to imagine the audition. I mean, just couch picture for this. it. Picture no. the audition room. I don't want to. Uh, picture all of these little kids going. <laughs> what I'm picturing and, is and, the and one guy that's like, going, no, 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 uh, not until we're in front of the camera, baby. <laughs> that's not. What's wrong with that? That's breastfeeding. I, I, that's, I'm thinking about the guy who's like, oh, all, uh, all. If you can this ask oh, for it, you can't get it. No, I don't want to. I don't want to comment. I don't think that that's. I don't. I don't agree with you. All right. Um, I don't want to like. We're not passing judgment on like how she's chosen. That I'm talking about the presentation of the story, not whether or not people should breastfeed after kids have teeth. All right. You want to talk about race or religion next? <laughs> we talk about them mixed together. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, we have some questions, um, and we are going to open it up to uh, the audience. But we actually have some from our listeners at home. Um, the first question uh, comes from a guy named Jim, which is weird. Everyone who ever, whoever calls in is named Jim. Uh, this is our reader mail section. He actually had an email to say that uh, about two months ago, we told him how to not make a lot of trouble at work uh, and how to settle a design dispute with we a bunch of people. We told someone not to make trouble at work? Yes. I know. Um, he was trying to uh, respond to really problematic design feedback. We gave him a step by step of how to do it, and he didn't get fired. So he, he emailed to thank us and ask us if we're going to be doing anything live. And so here's your answer. <laughs> For the that's people not, that, where's the question in there? Oh, that's, there's no question. Oh, are we doing anything live? And yeah, here's the answer. Right okay, there. next question. <laughs> uh, so we. Uh, you we guys got up early for this, by the way. Yep. 
Also, your bikes are locked up in a place that you can't get to them <laughs> until we're done. Yep, it's true. It's 100% true. Um, so I will say I am I'm very excited, and people might think this is a joke. We, got, we have two questions this week, both from people named Katie. Okay. Actually, like in reality, and they're both named Kathleen, too. I, I can't. I, it sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not. Um, everyone else is named Jim also. Um, Okay, so this is a question from a person who's not a uh, not a designer by trade and works in a nonprofit um, that doesn't have the funds to to get a designer, um, and she is wondering whether uh, we have suggestions for someone who's interested in learning some fundamentals of design without making a career of it, and whether there's anything that you think she can do to um, help her uh, help her nonprofit do a better job of like not picking really shitty clip art. Ben. Stop with the stop with the thing. He's supposed to be working and he's eating. I know he's eating a scone. <laughs> um, how they can do? They have to. They have to make this stuff internally. They don't have the resources, and, or they're not going to be able to get the resources soon. Like, what can she do to make herself a little bit uh, more well versed with design, uh, without you know going back to school and leaving her job at the nonprofit? Well, school's a horrible place to learn anything. All right, we talked so, about that before. So, Kathleen, don't go back to school. Yeah. She doesn't want to leave her job. So, what, I mean, what do you think might, uh, do you think she should read? Do you think she should, like, look at sites that she likes? Like, what is, is there well, a way to be, to, like, be a guardian of design, I guess, without being a designer? I mean, go look at things that are great. Go find them out. Go, you know, read about them online. Mm -hmm. You've got incredibly vast resources of this stuff. You've got, like, blogs that talk about good design. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you know, go to the museum bookstore and look at design stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, practice. Look, someone's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> we can start at Cali. Oh, I hope you don't have a bike. Uh, <laughs> Check. One. But, you know, until then, do as little as, do as little as possible. What do you mean? You know, keep things, keep things as simple as possible is what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the biggest mistake that I see when people are, you know, don't have a sense of design as they try to throw the kitchen sink at everything mm -hmm. and, you know, try to mask their inexperience with complexity. Mm -hmm. So just... We laugh, but it's like, that is just true. Is it funny because we're doing That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> For the last time. Also, if, if we count up to a certain number, do you get... Escorted out here. I'll, I'll start another tally of I almost didn't that you'll get make escorted it in out here. here. I, I got didn't. tackled by the guard. That's why you're looking so. That's why you're. I feel like you have an air of sort of damage right now. Is that what's going on? No, that's that's <laughs> just upbringing. Uh, Let's move okay. on to another question. No, so that, what I want to know for you is. Uh, do you, as a, as a, we've gotten questions before about how to how to talk about design internally, and it's often for designers how to talk about design. This person was particularly interested in finding out how to do a better job of talking about design as a non-designer to non-designers, mm -hmm. um, and how to how to do a good job of explaining why something might need to change or how something might need to change, and and whether she should like learn a lot of design language or just you know, talk about things the way they're already being spoken about? Like, is it better to set up best practices or? Well, the problem is the whole let's talk about design thing. It's never let's talk about design. I mean, you're designing something for a reason. So yep. talk about what that reason is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're designing a lost cat poster, you're, you shouldn't be talking about the design of the lost cat poster. You should be talking about whether this poster is going to help people find the cat. Yeah, and how to remove the tear stains. Right. We'll and, you know, if they find the cat, is there a, an easy way to contact the person who lost it? Right. So talk about things in terms of goals, not in terms of design. Okay. Once so what let's say you've established that this nonprofit is a cat finding nonprofit and and uh and they have lost like the cutest cat of all. Um and they're what they're trying to do is what they want to do is they want to make a border of the cat's face. And she thinks that's actually not a great idea. That doesn't actually help people find the cat. What it does is make a really bad border, and uh, how do I? How would how would you respond to that? That's not going to help people find the cat. That's just extra stuff there. That's not helping people find the cat. It's unnecessary. Get rid of it. So you think basically we can? She could say something like anything that's not necessary to the ultimate goal. Right. Get rid of everything you can. What you're left with is right. What about the like classic C of? But I like it. No. What, I mean, what do you say to that? 
Is it going to help you find the cat? All right, so you just repeat that. If you, I mean, if you like it, take it home. I don't care. Okay, that's a, no, that's a very good but idea. That's, you know, that's not the goal of what we're doing here. I'm, the goal here isn't to do something you like. The goal here is to find the damn cat. Is damn, a, are we swearing? We have to put money in for damn? I think damn's okay. Yeah, we never bleep it. Okay. Why do we bleep things? So that we cannot get explicit on the iTunes. So it's about Apple. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Apple, Apple is the Adobe. reason that we can't just express ourselves. In, for so many reasons, I think that's the case. Right. Um, all right, so uh, that's, I would say that maybe when you're talking is about... Is there any potential sponsor I haven't pissed off already? They, Apple wasn't going to give us money. No, they're not. Uh, <laughs> we're fine. We can, we can David it there, Goliath. Uh, I'm wondering if maybe... Why don't we take some questions? I mean, these people woke up early. Why don't we take some questions from them? Mike has invited you. Uh, Who's we, got a question for us? There's one over there. Behind the oh. oh wait, let's. Yeah. Wait a second. We gotta. We gotta. We're gonna bring the mic over to you. Erica, the lovely Erica Hall. It's for the people in the future, exactly. So please feel free to speak loud and proud into the mic. Placement of the question mark on the time cover was intentional. The are you mom enough question mark? Let's go back to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good call. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hadn't even noticed that. And, and, and wow. What's your, what's your first name yeah. and location, sir? So we can. Oh, yeah. Tell us who you are with that great question. Jason Fulford in seat number three. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Number seat number three is great. Uh, San Francisco. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a spectacular question mark question. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it makes it just so much worse even. The question mark is over her baby making parts. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do with that at all. We move on to the next I mean, I know question. what to do with it. I, yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, that seems like if you were doing that, Mike, you would have, that would have been your focus from the beginning as to how to get something over that. Well, if I were doing this, that other boob would have been exposed. <laughs> how? How would you have, just like right well, underneath or the kid pulling it down? Just Yeah, I mean, the kid pulling it down would have been good. Okay. Is this, do you find that actually interesting seeing the other boob while one of them also, is being, I think this, one this of them is, is a, being lactate, I lactating? I wouldn't have put a child in this position. I would have used a dwarf. Okay, there's, I'm starting a whole new tally. <laughs> By the that's end, a much better cover with Peter Dinklage. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually haven't done race or religion yet, but you've managed to offend a lot of people already. Welcome to the show. You're, you're listening to Let's Make Mistakes, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we've already opened it up to one question. Um, if people have, we have a couple other questions from uh, the home audience. If we can, we can go to those. If anybody has a question now about design, about uh, breastfeeding, uh, about Mike's uh, habits. Yeah. Yep. You can also say what you do if you want to. Uh, I'm Chris uh, from Oakland. So Woo. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I like how you work to, to demystify capital C creative in the design process. Um, but yes. but we have, you have a lot of smart creative people working in this. And so there's a point in the, in the execution phase, let's say, where you're working to solve all the little problems, the pixel nudging and the drop shadows and the word choices. And you're, you know, you're coming up with, with lots of little solutions, but, but then someone on the team has kind of a big insight about either something that maybe you missed or maybe just something that would is a better solution, right? And sometimes that big insight isn't so big. It'll take maybe half an hour mm -hmm. of going back and retracing your steps to sort of fix it. But sometimes it's going to be a couple hours or like staying late or, wow, that's g we can't make that change because that's going to take a couple of days to try to go back and do. And th this isn't something that the client's asking for, but it's your team who, you know, they want to do a the best job that they can and get the best product. Mm -hmm. 
So can you talk a little bit about that internal conversation about the trade-offs between over-delivering and like letting go? It's interesting. We get a question. We get questions a lot. It's, it's a good question. We get questions a lot about what happens when everything changes in the middle of a project. That's a great question. That's not over-delivering, by the way. If you think of a way to make the pro I mean, your goal is always to do the best, put out the best product you can. And, you know, sometimes those ideas come at the right time. Sometimes they come three days later than you would have hoped they come. But when they come, you have to listen to them. And then it's a matter of, you know, sitting down and weighing whether that idea is actually that much better and worth the amount of time that it's going to take to execute and possibly push a deadline back. But um, I, it's always worth looking into. Well, I would say it also, I think any time that, ha that ha something like that happens where you think of like, we should try this thing, I don't think it's ever, like, before it happens, you know this is actually the solution. You've got to try it before you know it's actually a solution. So I think we what we'll often do is say something like, uh, we might actually mention it to a client and say, like, hey, we have this idea and run it by them before. Not that we're going to like test, like we're, we have this idea to like change the color. That's not the sort of question that we'd be asking. It's not like a, not design direction, but we have this idea about a new, different way to solve this. Um, and I don't think we would burn hours on, on, on it in, unless we're trying something out until we've talked about the implications and why we're doing it. Um, and I think the most important thing is that everyone that's on the project is talking about this so that no one is thinking like, oh, you know, it's not like one designer or what the IA by themselves thinking like, oh, we have to reorganize this and do this by ourselves, that you can find ways to, without going back to the beginning or needing to stay late, because we don't stay late, uh, to, to how to how to solve that. And I think oftentimes it's, it's basically saying, having a conversation. If you find it out at five in the afternoon, it's having a conversation or sending an email to the client saying like, hey, we need to talk about this tomorrow. We have a great idea. But do, doing your best work is never out of scope. But I have to say we, that doesn't um, that never I guess having like a an exciting idea or like a you know a bolt of lightning never feels like it's coming at the wrong time. Like I don't feel like I've ever thought like oh man I wish I thought of I mean I thought I wish I thought of this before but like I thought of it so now I can do it like I right. just feel like it's not a um, yeah you don't like call the the client and say like hey I just thought of an awesome thing and if you're willing to pay me more I'll put it in the awesome thing yeah. But it's that's not going to work. That's cheesy. It's cheesy. Yeah. You know, I think, I feel like something, maybe like someone who wears this might do it, though. Is that, is that, do you like my mic? Everyone has my mic. That's nice. um, okay, that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Everyone knows everything. That's great. They're all scared. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have questions about Mike? All right, well, let's, let's go to another question um, from the home audience. Let me pull it up. Um, I will mention also uh, that we, we have made, um, one of the other emails we got was not a question. We got, an, uh, we got some reader mail. Um, we made a lot of stink about uh, there being no accomplished Craigs. No one named Craig who's accomplished. So we should probably ask first, is anyone here named Craig? <laughs> no, you, you mentioned the one that we thought of later. Anyone, I mean, it's, we're not going to make you stand up or do anything. Like, is anyone here named Craig? All right, yes, more, more proof. Um, <laughs> that, like, it was really hard to find a Craig that made, that had done something. We said, there's Craig Ferguson. Because I, I think we came up and we said that, that He's Craig. He's English, he doesn't count. He's Scottish, so he counts again. Whatever. Um, then there's Craig, someone mentioned Craig Newmark, but we got another, we got an email from someone um, who said that apparently Craig Etherick, Craig Etheridge, the red beard of glory. He's a biker. No. Doesn't count? No. And you've not heard of him? No. All right, well, th I mean, I mean, he's a biker. He's a, like, like a bike a messenger. Bike? Like a oh, bike messenger. <laughs> His bike's locked up on the fifth floor. <laughs> <laughs> Is not sending any messages now. Um, well, I would just—I I feel like that this is another point that, like, we still have. We found uh, what's the opposite of a hot spot? We found a Craig is a hot spot of not uh, uh, the name Craig is a lot of people, you know. Craig Bentner. Who's that? He was the first to sequence the human genome. That guy. Yes. The, the human genome guy. Still, we're on. We are still on one hand for for accomplished Craig. So I had uh, a dream about him this morning, by the way. <laughs> You want to tell us any more about that? No. Okay. Um, uh, we have another question. Uh, we have a question from a young designer. Uh, her name is Katie. Uh, 
her question is about um, she was faced last year at leaving school. How come the female fake question name is Katie? It's actually Katie. Do you want to see? No. Yeah, you do. Look. Here, just hand me your mail. No. <laughs> Uh, it's actually Katie. Um, do, you, do you want the fake uh, no, just mail question ahead. be Mike? No. Oh, so Mikola uh, had the question. Uh, she she left design school about a year ago and took a job. She was faced with the job of, uh, of the idea or the decision of going to a city where there was a, a design, like going to a design firm, like working in, at an at a actual design studio um, and working in-house at a smaller job in her hometown. And so she picked uh, working as uh, she, she was worried that she didn't have uh, enough experience to go to a design firm or to even like spend the time trying to get hired. Um, so she is working doing production design for a direct mail uh, company. And so her question is, d- do you think, can she learn to be a better designer there? Can she, like, how can she learn to be a better designer there? And can she um, in a place where design isn't really valued? Um, or, you know, or should she just be looking for a new job right away? go to a design studio that is the question from katie at home that is a complicated bee's nest mm-hmm. of questions uh i mean it first is. off you can learn to be a better designer anywhere as long as you want to learn how to be a better designer mm-hmm. um certain situations are definitely more open to that mm-hmm. like I, I mean i recommend that anybody who's starting off on a design career um try to get a job where they're working with more experienced designers mm-hmm and learn everything they can from them. Um, Unfortunately, what I'm seeing these days is a lot of really young designers go off and take jobs at startups where they're the only designer on the team. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, working at a place where, you know, design may be valued, Mm -hmm. but um, it's, they're, they're stunning their growth. Because they're not they're they're not in a room with people who have been doing this for years and years. Well, how do you? I mean, but people need jobs. So how do you suggest that? So let's say she needed this job. You know, she needed the job to pay her rent. So she's working a direct mail. Like, what can she do at her job now to to make herself a better designer? That's such an open ended question. I, I mean. Know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is there? Do you think that there is anything? That like, should she be, is it the same answer as, as before with the woman who's not a designer at all? Or should she be just looking to leave? I mean, it's, someone needs to design at those places. Someone's going to be doing that job. So. Yeah, I mean, it's possible to do g- good design anywhere. The, the question is whether you can get what you need in mm-hmm. terms of learning from inside the company where you are or whether you have to look outside. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like in her situation, she's going to have to look outside. Mm-hmm. Is it possible to do good design for a direct mail order company? Sure. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen it, mm-hmm. but I think it's probably possible. Yep. Um, sadly, I think once you get to a certain level of design, that's probably not the type of place you want to work. Right. No, but I think that idea of the being able to, like, what, where, no matter where you are, if you're trying to do, be a better designer or trying to solve problems in, in a better way, like you just you may have to look inside. You may need to look outside for for like either guidance or information about design. And I think that's that's fine. So she can stay there for now and do everything she can to uh, to push forward good design and, and look for a job if she wants to work with other designers soon. Yeah, I mean the most the the, the thing that concerns me most of or not concerns me. I don't know her, but um the. The biggest problem there is that is that she felt like she didn't have what it took to get a better job. Right. I mean, that's a lack of confidence, not a lack of experience. You get the experience by having the confidence to put yourself in a place where you can get the experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like there's there's a lot going on. And I, by the way, I read um, two sentences of what is a, what is like. 10,000 words. We got an essay from her. So I, I would say the first thing she needs to do is like spend her time on her on her resume. Uh, you wrote us a very nice letter, Katie, but focus on the resume. Uh, get a new job. Um, so she's... I've never read a resume in my life, by the way. I know. You hired me and you still don't know what I've done before I don't before know what this. you did yeah. before this. I know. No idea. <laughs> I just interviewed you and you felt right. Yeah. I w- the reason actually I got hired is because I was wearing... Uh, I, I recognized the shirt you had because a friend of mine had given it to it and you had designed it yourself. So as soon as I mentioned that I knew that design, you were like, all right, she said. That's when the interview was basically over. Erica asked me some more questions. But after I got the answers, like, oh, I know that shirt, uh, you asked, stopped asking me questions. That's all you need. 
just if anyone's ever interviewing for Mike, just tell him that you like you know some design that he's made. Yeah, You're in. It's true. <laughs> we are about to double or triple or quadruple in size. Um, all right, great. So I think I think the the main point of of being able to uh, both have the confidence to apply for jobs that you not necessarily you you may not think that you have the. I don't know the the design skills like that's you're going to get them there and you need to just up, keep applying for jobs that you want not uh, the ones that you think you're qualified. I for. had absolutely no idea what I was doing at my first design job. What'd you do? Um, I was working. I mean, this was way back before most of you were born. Um, this was working in in a desktop publishing department at a copy shop. Yeah. And um, I had just graduated from art school so I convinced them I had a design degree mm -hmm. and they gave me a job as, as their designer mm -hmm. and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing mm -hmm. I just learned it as I went yeah and here you are speaking in front of creative mornings still lying to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to note um, you laid down a challenge uh, a baked good challenge last week and I will note that no one here brought us baked goods Unless someone's hiding, they would have them in their pockets. Baked good outside. Oh yeah, I mean Adobe brought them to us, so thank you Adobe. But we they can have a picture bikes. with Adobe. Uh, but we don't, uh, we don't, we don't have any extra baked goods. So I just want. Because those people care about you. What? Those people are saving your life, girl. Who's this guy? I, oh my God, it's the Paleo Hobo. <laughs> this is the Paleo Hobo that we've heard about. Yeah. The paleo this is a recurring fake character on our podcast. <laughs> How exciting. He's recurring. Semi-recurring. Semi -recurring. As in, it's, he's recurred twice. This is, yeah. is that a guitar? This is, this is the recurrence. This is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he has recurred. Um, so the paleo hobo is here. Uh, and he, apparently he thinks that people not caring about me enough to not bring baked goods means that they care about me. They're showing you their love. So the paleo hobo... There we go. <laughs> Why don't you show me the way, Paleo Hobo? <laughs> well, I'm looking for a hand up, but don't serve it up just yet. I've got a hand in less of what can it can't get at. It might sound presumptuous or like I'm putting on some hairs. But it can be quite scrumptious, even the all over there. This will get stuck in your head, I promise. <laughs> Modern diets with their cereals and breakfast full of grain. Well, they're none too good for your liver and they're none too good for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even do it with a straight I'm face. <laughs> no. Got it. Too many carbs this morning. Okay. Just try these paleo flapjacks. Well, they're almost pretty good. I make them with ground almonds, just like a caveman would. Oh, don't give me none of your taters and don't give me none of your rice. What the carbohydrates do to my metabolism? Son, it just ain't nice. No, grill me up a sirloin steak or taste the rest of the I'll take the carbs. On the road again. Save yourself. <laughs> uh, and we'll. Where are the rails taking you next? Yeah. Well, I've got to get back down to Florida. What's happening in Florida? Well, see this boot on my foot. Yeah. The South Beach hobo shoved me off a train. <laughs> no. And I got to go take my vengeance. Yeah. <laughs> They're um. There are a lot of hobos wearing daring fireball shirts. Is that a thing? <laughs> this, uh, in particular, he, he, the reason he's wearing that boot is that he lo he left his uh, his toe shoes. You would be shocked at the number of hobos wearing daring fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Where so the South? I realize the South Beach diet would be in Florida. Where do you go to beat up that like juice and cayenne pepper diet? L.A. L.A. Probably. All right. Um, so we all assume that you'll go there next. All right, I think we have, uh, we have time. I guess we have time for one question. One more <laughs> now, question Now that you audience. guys have been thoroughly. Actually, we have a question that came over through Adobe Connect. Oh, awesome. Seriously? How do we, are you going to ask us? They got us? that to work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask, ask the question. Ask the question. So, uh, We're excited. Never me back. So the <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to escort you out. 
Um, yeah, it's from somebody named David. There's only four names. <laughs> and um, David's question from Cyberspace or Adobe Land or wherever he is, is how there, do Adobe. you bring design to developers? Ooh. Do you bring design to developers or should they be doing, should they be there all along? Thank you for your question, Dave. Uh, we are very excited to, to talk about that. I think we've talked before about, um, about the cultures of, of developers and design. Uh, Mike, do you have any, how do you usually bring design to developers? Like on, in your hands? On a bat. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, the problem here is, is the kind of culture that allows a question to be phrased that way. You don't bring design to developers just as you don't bring, I mean, if, if you're all working on, I mean, you're all working on something that needs to be designed and then that design needs to be implemented and then that all needs to work correctly. This is all part of a larger design picture. And if everybody understands the, you know, the reason why certain decisions are made and the goals that those decisions help to accomplish, like everyone needs to understand that. You can't just say, hey, these decisions were made over here, and now they need to be implemented over here. That's a lot of no knowledge lost during that walk of shame. Who's the shamed one in that situation? The people who set the process up that way. Yeah. It's the shame, the shame of watching people walk. Yeah. Yeah. The sitting there and watching your workers walk of shame. Um, I mean, I, th I think the other thing is that it would, it's the same question we've gotten before is like, how do you bring research? to design or how do you bring research to development like they should be um i think it's it maybe oversimplifies the project that they should the problem that they should be involved at every step of the way but they really should like they should be like the developer should be there should be a developer talking with you about scoping the project um if you're doing client services there should be a developer there at the very beginning of a project there should be a researcher there there should be a designer um you've got it like people need to know what they're doing and there's times i know at, at mule we, we'll have times where we're working on multiple projects and maybe a, a developer wasn't there until like you know a first design review and that's a problem they need to be there and they'll raise a, they'll raise a question and say like um how do you expect this to actually work and then we have to answer that question and it would have been it's great to have them very early on even if it's just intermittently checking in even if they're only recurring twice uh and we should mention that Dave is actually our, our, also our developer. So yeah. actually, did, did you just get on that uh, Adobe Connect and, and ask that question? Yeah. I Adobe Connected from my guitar. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we were working with a client a very, very, very long time ago. Um, and w I was interviewing one of their, uh, uh, like actually their lead designer. And You were doing the interviews? We were having a beer. <laughs> okay. Um, and he starts talking to me about the development team. Mm -hmm. And I realized during the conversation that the development team was this mythical thing, mm -hmm. like on the company directory. And he didn't actually interact with these people too much. So I asked him, like, how, like, how often do you, do the design team and the development team, which, by the way, should be one team, um, how often do you guys like chat about what you're working on? Oh, like we don't. Like, where do you guys sit in relationship to each other? It's like, oh, like three floors apart, mm -hmm. and they're working on the same thing. And I said, well, you guys should actually be sitting together. And he says, well, we actually put in a requisition to uh, get our 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 uh, desks in the same area, or at least closer. And that was like four months ago. Mm -hmm. and it's making its way up the chain. You're not going to do good work in yeah. a situation like that where a, a boneheadedly simple decision needs to take four months to get up a chain. Yeah. I mean, it sounds a little bit more like that's the problem with that question a little bit is that it sounds like a baton, like you can pass design off. Right. Or you can pass wireframes off, and then it's just like all the information. Uh, I mean, it puts a lot of emphasis on having all of your thought and all of everything be perfect, which I think is one of the other problems that often happens in design is that people spend too much time trying to make it perfect and make it make sense all on the page without being able to talk about it. And you need to be able to talk about it and explain how it's supposed to work. Otherwise, it might not work later yeah. when someone you know, missed the really important module uh, that is on your beautiful, perfected comp. Uh, all right. Thank you, Dave, from Adobe uh, Connect. Exactly. Uh, do we have any other questions from the room? Yes. Run all the way over there. You can also have like statements or accusations. That I, we, we accept those. Hello, 
Sir, um, what is your name and favorite animal? <laughs> my name is David, and my favorite animal is cat. <laughs> <laughs> you like cats. the abstract of yes, cat. Just abstract you don't like, yeah, yeah. You don't like an individual cat. You like cats. Okay, got it. So I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts or feelings on this whole uh, programmer phenomenon that's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have Go, thoughts Katie. feelings? <laughs> Do I have any feelings? I have thoughts, and I have uh, well thought out ideas about it. Uh, I also have a lot of feelings about it too. Um, well, we we actually hold um, on a second. How many people here work in a company with a CEO? Raise your hand. Okay, now how many people here work in a company with a female CEO? Raise your hand. That's a lot less hands. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Um, the programmer situation. I, I think it's something. Uh, I mean, it's it's really frustrating. I, I have you've read the as everyone who read the Tasneem Naha the Mother Jones article. Um, we are actually going to have um, someone on the show in a couple weeks to talk about this in particular. But I'm very excited to talk about it any and all times. Is uh, it Farouk? Yeah, it's always Farouk. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, okay, so let's have this be your last question. Um, well, the thing that I. Uh, I mean, we talk about this a lot. There's a there's a huge. Uh, should we should we summarize what the problem is? Go for it. Um, so and and feel free, uh, Dave David, to uh, summarize if he still has the mic. Um, but the the issue that we're talking about um, is uh, from an article called I think it's called Gang Bang Interviews, and um, which is really hard to say. And uh, there was something about, about bikinis in there and, as well. And and bikini shots, yeah. Yeah. This idea of there being, especially in, in the Bay Area, especially in Silicon Valley, this sort of growing culture of douchey frat boy bro attitude and language, especially like basically turning. Uh, development shops into frat houses um, and and having just very blatantly and uh, very uh, I mean just very on their sleeve about the fact that they have parties and there will be they'll actually like advertise parties for a for a startup and say like there will be hot girls there and there was uh, which is problematic for a variety of reasons but Mike um, do you we've talked about this before in terms of diversity in terms of how how to build a community of design and development that has more diversity in it and is more welcoming to people. Um, do you think that there's any likelihood that that can happen in in the uh, development community? Are we like descending into uh, a pit of of awfulness in your opinion, or can can we uh, stop having uh, development shops act like Revenge of the Nerds? I have just seen a black president come out in support of gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in a racist, homophobic, dying East Coast city. Philly. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I believe that anything is possible at this point. Um, I also believe it's going to take a lot of work and effort. I think it's stupid to set up a situation that excludes a huge percentage of the possible talent base out there. Yeah, I think I, I think, think that's just a stupid business move. I think the problem that I see is that what this is not this isn't like yeah, this is not it's not a business move though. It's it's that people finally feel like they are in control and instead of saying like I'm in control now, I may have been beaten up when I was younger or people made fun of me. Instead of now that I'm in control, I can make things the way I want it. I'm just going to do things like the way that those people that were awful to me did. And I, I think um maybe these are the uh, maybe the, the problem is that the the people leading the charge of this sort of programming and really sort of uncomfortable situation for women weren't those uh, those you know nerds that are you know now turned developers they were actually the guys leading that charge you know you know 20 30 years ago they are they're the they're the jocks from from uh, revenge of the nerds and they've just decided to say like actually we need you to make money for us uh, programmers so why don't you come and be cool with us and the way that you do that is to do the same stuff we've always done and I think the we talked about this a little bit it's it's a there's a problematic um, relationship right now between I think the way that uh, a lot of startups treat specifically uh, development as the like engine room of everything and that there's a lot not a lot of attention paid to the other people who are involved in the process of, of making something work and making something you know bringing something into being um, and so like that's why we've talked before on this about uh, developer slave ships where you'll sense that people will buy a company and the just the developers will go with it as though that's where all of the thought and energy there and everything were, came from? People will, will, where a company will buy a startup specifically to get because the, it has X amount of engineers. 
And uh, it's much easier to get, and much easier and cheaper to get that amount of engineers by acquiring a startup mm -hmm. than it is to put in the time and effort to try to attract people to your company. Yep. But the idea that those engineers are the thing that's going to solve your problem or change everything as opposed to the people that worked on maybe they made a really great product but you know most likely they had a lot of other inputs to that and it wasn't just I mean, those developers i'm not trying to diss developers who stay up really late and work really hard but they, they aren't the only people that did that work and i think there's an emphasis put on that and because of that um i think the people that are, are with the money are, are in charge of, of making them feel like they're wanted and have fun and the way that they know how to do that is to to make a really shitty situation for women <laughs> Uh, and I, I guess uh, uh, I'll put two in for that. Actually, I'm happy. I'm happy for that. Um, thank you for your question. It's it's something that is obviously a big problem, and I think one of the ways uh, to combat that is just every. I mean, I try to just do spot checks, and anytime someone makes those jokes, I mean, I, it makes you a not fun person. But I just have said like, is that supposed to either subvert the joke and respond to it, or mention that that's like. It, what the point of their of, of their invite you know mentioning inviting women was? But you, just, know, you know, you know who's gotten a free pass on this so far? Who is? Um, I mean, this comes down from the top. Yep. And there's you know there's a VC culture that actively encourages this sort of behavior, and you know that's this is the midlife crisis now. Mm -hmm. I'm you know I'm not buying a, a convertible red Corvette. I'm buying a startup with a bunch of bros in it and we can hang out and we can go on offsite and buddies. we can ice each other and we can be buddies. And, this, and I can and this is how I get away from my family now by hanging out with, you know, my kids down at the startup. Yeah, I want to just mention really importantly that any but like just you for, know who I'm talking about. <laughs> for our listeners yeah. out there who say I am not sexist because I have a kid. Just because you manage to get someone pregnant does not mean you're not sexist. And I really, really want people to remember that. And Erica... <laughs> uh, did you... Sometimes not even I know where she's going. <laughs> no, I, mean, I get a lot of uh, responses from people like, uh, you know, you th you're calling me sexist, but like I have a wife and a daughter. Like, yep. I hope you treat them better. And I hope you're putting therapy money yeah. away for both. All right, we're supposed to wrap it up. We have the last question. Hit it. I just had a comment on the prevalence of the the programmer yeah. phenomenon in the area. Um, I'm not a programmer. Uh, I'm a sign painter, mm -hmm. and we get the fun job of going around, and uh, a lot of these startups hire us to paint like fun things in their offices. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but an unnamed startup or business in the area. Um, few blocks that way. Yeah. Uh, had us That'll be Zynga, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and paint um, titles above their conference rooms, and one of them was specifically the Bromance Chamber. <laughs> and I just, it disgusted me. I was like really uncomfortable in that environment just being there a few days. Yeah. Why'd you do it? Why'd I do it? Yep. Uh, I don't know. It was come down the chain. They hired us to paint names above their conference yeah. rooms and that was the one they gave us so i've said this before i like this is like a major core philosophy of design for me you are responsible for the things you help put in the world the fact that there's a room that says bromance chamber on it sadly part of that is now your fault <laughs> Well, and I hate pointing that, and I, I, I don't mean to accuse you of anything, but I mean, as designers, we really need to start thinking this way. If you don't think something should exist in the world, do not participate in it. And I think that, you know, in this situation in particular, that we really have to wrap up, I'd love to talk with you afterward. Uh, I think that basically finding ways to not participate in things that you don't want to do um, and, and to buy Mike's book. <laughs> Um, is is the, the crucially important thing, and I think the the, the way that I handle that because I'm not the person who p pushes pixels around and, and I'm not a designer is to ask that question really early on and tell someone I think they're making the wrong choice, and and tell them not like refuse to say I think you're making the wrong choice. How can we make a better choice? Like or, and tell them what the effect of their their what I think is a bad decision is going to actually have. It's like do you realize that you're keeping women out of this and there's a, a weird sort of sexuality to it? So.
that's my fast version of let's talk later. Uh, all right, we are. Uh, this up. was this was uh, a live version of let's make mistakes. Uh, so you heard a small amount of clapping, and that clapping is the very polite clapping of people in this room.